Hello, this is the weekly live broadcast of the Twist Podcast, and we do hope that you are here for the science because it's about to get started. How's it going, co-hosts? Good. Looking for whale gifts. Oh, yeah, very good. <laughs> well, as you do as the show starts, of course. Look for the look for the whale gifts. If you have whale gifts, tweet them at Blair. No, no. <laughs> I am good. <laughs> okay. All right, everyone. Let's. Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we going to do this? Are you ready, ready for science? Are you ready out there? Okay, everyone out there, you know, if you're watching this, this is all the stuff. There's no editing for the video stream, but the podcast might be edited or the radio show will definitely be edited. But no matter how you enjoy all this twissiness, make sure you subscribe, hit the notica notification buttons on whatever platform you're using right now so that you never miss an episode. Let's do this. Boom! Boom! Oh, yeah, I, yes, I do sound effects all the time. If you watch me regularly, you know I am a veritable font of sound effects. Okay, ready? In. Three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 880, recorded on Wednesday, June 15th, 2022. How to see the galaxy. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your head with brains, babies, and wannabe bats. But first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following program is meant for audiences of all ages. However, from time to time, we will talk about things that might be for more mature audiences. Topics might include Frank talks about sex amongst invertebrates, or we may make a few immature jokes while probing the subject of black holes. At other times, the subject is innocent sounding as cats could veer off into a nearly but not quite profanity laced rant about brain parasites. There's really no telling. What we can promise is that the stories you are about to hear, however strange, however nerving they may be, no matter how bad the puns we make them about make about them get, uh, they are entirely sourced from actual science studies published in the past week or so and presented here for your infotainment on This Week in Science, coming up next. Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We're back again. Woo! Justin has flown over the pond. We are all together to talk about the science of all sorts of things. Is it Lobster Day or Mobster Day today, Blair? As I was looking at the twist calendar and there's a little overlay of text and I wasn't sure whether we should be celebrating lobsters or mobsters. It's Lobster Mobster Day. So don't forget oh. to pay your crustacean oh. their protection money. Okay? <laughs> wow. uh, that's That claw's got a racket. Okay. We've got science. We've got so many stories. What are we going to talk about this week? I have stories about, I wrote them down here, I have stories about baby brains and pieces of the solar system that we decided to pick up and look at, and Gaia, hmm. and Alan, but we don't want to talk about Alan. Justin, what did you bring? I've got uh, a story, a very baddie story about human echolocation, 
Uh, astronomers found a new multi-planet system, and it's really close by, as well as some correlative nonsense from the field of psychology. Woo! Correlative nonsense. Yeah, just what we like to, wait, call science? Mm. Okay, we'll talk about that, that one, one later. Yeah. <laughs> Blair, what is in the animal corner? Oh, it's my turn. Um, yes. I brought uh, whales and seals. Apparently, I'm still su stuck in World Oceans Day over in the animal corner. And then before that, I have a really fun story about wigs. So I like wigs. I love wigs. Wigs are fantastic. You can be anyone with a new wig. All right. Well, we are going to jump into all these stories and more. And as we do, I want to remind you that if you have not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, we are available as a podcast. Look for This Week in Science anywhere you find your favorite podcasts. We are also broadcasting live weekly, 8 p.m. Pacific time on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. You can find us as Twist Science on Twitch and Twitter and Instagram. And if all of this is just lots of names and bloobly blops, just look for twist.org on your friendly neighborhood web browser. Okay. Subscribe, click the notification buttons, and let's dive in to the science. What? Let's Woo. look at the universe. Well, not the whole universe. Maybe just our galaxy with Gaia. Mm. Yes. Now, we might, when you hear Gaia, you might think of, you know, Gaia, Earth Mother, all that yeah. kind of what's stuff. She, what's right? she doing in space? What is she looking around for? What is trying she to, doing? Trying to find new people to live on her? Well, she's not out in the space. Gaia is a uh, is the European Space Agency's mission to look at the Milky Way galaxy. And there is a wonderful, wonderful telescope with two optical telescope instruments, three instruments upon it for collecting different wavelengths of light. One billion pixel camera. That's, That's a, a camera of... with some pretty good do resolution. We, do we even have a TV that can... <laughs> Pretty, pretty, pretty pixelated. Uh, but Gaia is looking to create the most accurate 3D map of our galaxy. And we've reported on Gaia over the years. Uh, the ESA has released data a couple of times. But just this week on, the June, on June 13th, they released their third data dump. And a whole bunch of articles came out in a special edition of an astronomical journal. Uh, Gaia is in orbit around Lagrange Point 2, and from there, it's looking at almost 2 billion objects in our galaxy. Position, velocity, brightness, temperature, composition, the type inside our galaxy, looking at stars, binary stars, exoplanets, interstellar medium, so the dust and gas that's in between stuff, solar system mm. objects. It's also looking at stuff outside the solar system. So it's looking at the stars in our neighborhood. So looking at position and distance and the motion of those stars. Also looking, uh, that's the astrometry. Astrometry? Astro astrom astrometry. Anyway, pronouncing that one great. Photometry is looking at the chemicals in stars, the dust, the color, the mass, the temperature, brightness changes, the age of the stars, giving us all sorts of information about stars within the galaxy. And then also there's spectroscopy, which is looking at chemical composition. Composition, And this is the stars. This is the dust in the interstellar medium. This is all the stuff to figure out what is where and how our galaxy has evolved. So this data release three, according to the ESA release, it, it includes a total of 1.8 billion Milky Way stars. 1.8 billion stars, which is... That's a drop a, in the bucket. It's just a <laughs> lot of objects. And one of the really things, really cool things about this is that by looking at the chemical composition of stars and the brightness of the stars, it's able to determine things like stellar interlopers where there might be stars in places that they didn't start out because they've been shot out because of gravitational forces from their original space in 
the galaxy. And because of their their chemical composition, we can know how old they are, um, what stage of evolution, stellar evolution they're in. And so we're going to get a really good idea of like, what is where? So, hey, here's a young area of stars, but oh, there's this star that seems to be much more older stuff, like hydrogen and helium and that kind of stuff. Doesn't have this, this star doesn't have a lot of heavy metals in it. So, hmm, how did it get here? And we can start looking at the forces that might have led to where everything is in our interstellar neighborhood. According yeah. to Paul Disney in the chat room, a 4K screen has 8.29 million pixels. So it's a lot more than 4K. Yeah. So, so that yeah. means we don't have a TV or a monitor that can see all the pixels, but it, it will zoom in really nicely. Yeah. Um, other things that Gaia is going to be looking at also, it captures stuff happening not just inside our, our galaxy, but also outside uh, the Milky Way galaxy. So it's also taking a look at quasars, supermassive black holes that are accreting matter, uh, also at 2.9 million additional galaxies around our own galaxy so that we have an idea of like where things are in the sky because you have to have points in the sky to reference the points in our sky it's all it's all very complicated yeah the greeks figured it out a long time ago though mm -hmm. and another aspect of uh what they're looking at is uh they're also going to be looking at uh they're they're going to be they are looking at asteroids so they're taking an uh, a look at near earth asteroids main belt asteroids jupiter trojans Mars crossers, centaurs, trans-Neptunian objects. It can also Gaia has such good resolution it can see if an asteroid has a moon. Wow. Which is in itself very very cool. Uh, really but cool. the 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 you know the coolest thing that they are are talking about is the fact that uh it's the largest 3D chemical map of our galaxy ever created. Much much higher resolution than we've ever taken a look at our galaxy before. And uh, it really will allow us to understand our own galaxy, but also because of that, our, our place in the universe. Yes. Which is pretty exciting. But then, it, 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 what? Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, it's getting even more exciting. As, oh. uh, but I was going to More exciting? More yeah. exciting? Getting even more exciting is astronomers have discovered a new multi-planet system, and it's only 10 parsecs away. Which uh, uh, How far to, is that? <clears throat> according to Star Trek, that's pretty close, I think. But it's uh, still 33 light years away from the Earth. <clears throat> so it's too far away to vacation. Uh, if you started uh, tomorrow... You would end up there the end of the universe. Uh, <laughs> but it is. That's too long. It is for communications. It is within the range that communication, if intelligent life be out there, we could send it a message. We'd have to wait 33 years until they got it. They'd need to decipher that message, figure out what the heck we were talking about. Uh, that could take a little while. Then they might uh, take a year or more to kind of uh, form the response, you know, come up with a reply that's, you know, something smart and funny, but not too, like, unserious. Something that's uh, friendly. It doesn't give off that come invade me vibe. And then, and then so they figure all that out. And then they, so they send their response. And then it'd be another 33 years before that we got that response but it's so it would be 66 that. before they heard back from us and that's even that's in then a little bit more because then then yeah it'd be because then we got to wait and then respond and send it back again so that it's 66 years between these so by the time that we had like a, a start a good start to a conversation the we ourselves would probably have degenerated into a bunch of cybernetic gig workers trying not to wander too far from the factory floor, lest we fall off the edge of our flat earth. Uh, so really, what's uh -huh. the point? But other than that, this does look like scientists have found more dead rocks in space because it's, uh, <laughs> it's a rather small and cool dwarf star. 
It has at least two rocky Earth-sized planets, which is exciting, except that they are likely not habitable as their orbits are so close to the star. The temperatures will be too high to sustain liquid water anywhere on their surface. Nevertheless, scientists are excited about the system because it's so close, it does give the opportunity, uh, the proximity and the brightness give us the ability to study this system better than we've been able to study uh, systems that are much, much further away. I've been watching a lot of Star Trek lately, and I feel like the main moral of that is don't send a message. <laughs> It'll get misconstrued or used in some way and yeah. we'll get blamed. No, I don't know. But um, it's no, that's pretty cool. I like the idea of being able to also like send. Uh, I don't know. That would be pretty wild. But I guess send a, a mission that would be many generations in the making and then be able to communicate with them. So that but it would but if, the, if we do, so even traveling at the traveling at the speed of light, you would be like, I'm going to dedicate my life for the next 33 years to just going there. Yeah, you turn okay? into a salamander. So that'd be no good. But that's at the speed of light. <laughs> we aren't capable of I mean, our best shot our, our moon shot for maybe get up to around a spacecraft and go around 1% of this speed mm -hmm. of light. So mm -hmm. then it's 100 times 33 years. It's 3,300 years. Yeah, it's fine. Right. You know, Each it's just like no, 500 generations. Nobody no wants deal. that. <laughs> nobody cares. By the time just we get Just a couple there. of generations for sure. But, I mean, we can send a message. It'll take 66 years to get it to get one back if they receive it and there is life and they translate it and decide to send a message back. Or in that period of time, it doesn't hurt. We've sent a message, but we also discover that there really is no possibility of anything other than microbial life. So what's the harm? It just goes. The microbes might figure it out. Yeah, maybe the microbes. I, realize, I mean, I did, those little microbial calculators. Yeah. I did realize that if you took that 3,300-year 3, uh, trip, if you had a colony ship that went out there to go visit or whatever, you'd still get the messages right mm -hmm. that 33 year message you could still you could even be yep. at some point in the middle and get them uh before they they make it 16 and a half years yeah right and then and then at some point you know it's like oh hey don't come after all yeah things are real bad <laughs> and then you're like, yeah you gotta turn the ship around it's like oh colony we were gonna go to a different planet and then you come back to the earth and you're you know three four thousand years later and nobody nobody even knew you left they really like, forgot about you at that point <laughs> yeah it's that uh idiocracy story right mm -hmm. frozen preserved in time and then nobody remembers that they happened to do that back when the experiment took place i, I would hate to become one of those samples that's just lost in the back of the freezer yeah. yeah, that's a that's a heck of a way to go there this is a side, side thing but i have asked a number of people as i do uh, if they could time travel, they could travel anywhere in time, would they? And almost invariably, people pick the future. They'd be terrified of going into the past and messing something up and creating a paradox of ruining their lives and ruining the world. But going forward, nobody cares. That's their problem. Future you can change problem. the future. It hasn't happened yet in our telling of the story, Doing even though everything is time. happening all at the same moment everywhere. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. It is. But I wanted to I wanted to follow up with this also. We're we're not just looking outside of our solar system. Um, we're also looking in our solar system. And Justin, as a past Hayabusa fan, you should be very excited about this story. We have a an analysis of the samples from asteroid Ryugyu Raigyu. Oh, this is the second. This is sec Hayabusa two. Hayabusa 2 has returned and been analyzed. And researchers are very excited about this. Of course, they have taken part of the sample and used that for their analysis while maintaining more sample to be studied in the future when we have better technology. This is the foresight Smart. of scientists knowing that our technology and our ability to analyze will get better. So they're saving it, kind of like the Apollo moon missions and the... 
the soil samples from the moon. Or, and archaeologists, is... archaeologists do that all the time. They'll dig up part of a site, but leave the rest for future archaeologists and better technology and that sort of thing. Yeah, and it's absolutely fantastic uh, to save it for the future. But the current knowledge is that Ragu is made up of the material that was floating around in space that condensed together to form the sun and the planets oh, four and a half yeah. billion yeah. years ago when our solar system was system was formed Raigu was that dust that was there a lot of it co coalesced and clumped and turned into the sun and a little little bit of it made a rock called Ra that we call Raigu now that floats around in space but it's been floating around since the beginning of our solar system and part of the data that is very interesting is that they have chemical evidence that the material in the sample, while it's dry now, did go through a period of something like a mud ball. So at some point in time, Ragu heated and water that was probably ice within it from early uh, in the solar system, the ice melted and made it a mud ball and so that now it's dry and so it's a desiccated mud ball asteroids the desiccated mud balls of our solar system so forgive my um ignorance but so does does this this buddy have its own orbit around the sun yes yes it does yeah it has its own orbit um but it's one of those yeah objects that Goes around. I actually, I should, I am not recalling whether that this is a Mars asteroid or whether it's further out. I want to say that uh, it's a Mars asteroid. So does that but... mean it has an orbit around Mars, or its orbit is impacted by Mars, but it's still orbiting? Oh, around it's the sun? Uh, it between. So uh, there, there are Martian asteroids that are out past uh, at the asteroid belt, out past Mars. This is why we, we yeah, we, we uh, seldom hmm. go out uh, to, the, don't to, go out that to those far. other giant, planets. Giant wet muddy hail. I get it. <laughs> wet muddy hail. Yes. Yeah. So, but early this, the, the mud ball stage was like 500,000 years into the formation of our solar system. So it was very oh, wow. early. And they think that the melting water, the mud ball, was created due to the uh, uh, nuclear radiation, so the, the particles emitting, the nuclear radio radioactive particles emitting rate, heat radiation uh, that melted the water, not that it came by the sun and melted okay. at that point in time. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but let's see. Uh, Rag G at C Y U and um, let's see this part can be edited out of the podcast, but um, I just want to check really fast on the orbit of Ragu. Yeah. Give a give us a moment as Kiki adjusts her telescope. <laughs> yeah. Ah, where's the yes. earth and Spot there's Hayabusa Jaxa and I need a good a picture. Uh, there's all sorts of pictures. Let's see if I can get this one in here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Tess Tickle is asking if the solar system is like four and a half billion years old. Well, the earth is about that old. I don't know how much before that the solar system. Not much. Not much before that, yeah. I guess um, it's about four billion, so it's a half a billion years before. Yeah, but there had to be there had to be another solar system before our solar system. Because there it is. Yes, so stuff that was created in a supernova that's here on Earth, supposedly gold forms this way. Uh, so that had to there had to be that. Uh, we, we might have been made up of the leftovers of a supernova. 
very potential. Well, we would have to have been because of the uh, proportions of heavy metals that are available in our solar system. Yeah. So we are the product of earlier, the deaths of earlier stars. Um, but yes, so this... Uh, the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Ragu is uh, just inside of the Earth-Mars um, hmm. distance. So it's right in there. It's right in there. Mm -hmm. um, but it crosses over the Martian orbit. It crosses over Earth's orbit. It's right. It's yeah. Got a. It's a little bit off kilter, but there it is. Hmm. Neat. Somebody threw out uh, 13, I think 13 billion was the age of the whole universe. The whole universe, yes. But it's it's, uh, it's older also, than that they've, now. They've, they've, yeah, they've pushed it back. Keeps turning out to be a, a billion or two years older than we ever think it is. Yeah. Or it's a Mobius right. strip and it's infinity. Oh. <laughs> well. Why not? Let's wave. Let's, let's. Let's wait for more data from Raigu and yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll learn more about our solar system and maybe the universe as well from all of this. All right. We've done a lot of space news for the start of the show. Blair, is it time to put on a wig? It certainly is. Oh, I love wigs. Wigs are so fun. But also for many people, wigs are actually an important piece of health and mental care. Um, you could have alopecia, you could be going through chemotherapy. There could be all sorts of reasons that a human um, might need to wear a wig to help feel um, more self-confident, more comfortable, what have you. And so the aside from just me loving to wear wigs, <laughs> there's a reason to want wigs to last a long time, look realistic, and feel realistic. And this is something that science has not yet fully figured out. That's because real hair that is attached to a scalp grows out, has constant impact from the oils in your skin, and uh, just generally can bounce back from damage easier and all these things. And that's why wigs, after just a couple of wearings, can already start to show signs of wear and tear, whether they're real or they're synthetic materials. Washing, UV exposure, repeated styling, they become dry and brittle. And so um, in the past, researchers have spray coated a layer of graphene oxide on wigs, or other teams have immersed wig hairs in keratin haloisite nanocomposite. And these have worked okay, but it is difficult to cover an entire hairpiece with these methods, may not be scalable, and it has been imperfect overall. And so uh, a new piece of research um, wanted to look at uh, a nanocomposite applied with a approach that is used for coating surfaces in other situations with an ultra thin film. These films are known as Langmuir Bloggett technique applications. Um, so they these films, this particular LB technique, uh, they think that it could actually improve coverage and increase durability. So first they had to come up with the actual nanocomposite, which was a, a blend of keratin and graphene oxide. And then the method is they actually dipped synthetic or human hairs into water in a special apparatus with movable side barriers. And after the nanocomposite was spread on the water's surface with an atomizer, the barriers were moved inward to compress the film. And I love this. The, uh, they liken it to the trash compactor in Star Wars. <laughs> so, so the walls are coming in and that essentially binds the uh, nanocomposite to the hair. This provides more complete even coverage. And after hairs were treated with this approach, they sustained less UV damage, they were less prone to breakage, and they could hold more moisture than those that were immersed in a nanocomposite just kind of dunked in it. They also dissipated heat better, which is related to styling tools, and generated less static electricity when they were rubbed with a rubber sheet, which is important for those of us with rubber sheets. Or, you know, if you want to just be out in the world. Static electricity happens all the time with hair and especially with wigs. Yeah, the synthetic materials get significantly more static. Yes, absolutely. So the 
that's the long and short of it <laughs> is that <laughs> um, this is a new application technique and a new nano composite. It looks very encouraging based on these kind of small clumps of hair that they tried it on. So of course the next step is to apply to whole wigs to see if this is scalable and to see how they could uh, make this accessible to the average person with a wig or if they could treat wigs with this before they are purchased by a consumer. Or if they could treat the fibers that are used by the wig makers mm -hmm. before they are even, oh, yeah, absolutely. before they even go into the wig making process. Yeah, especially since a lot of wigs are dyed or mm -hmm. treated in other ways. This is totally something that you could just add an extra step to the process before you, you blend the wig kind of. That's, um, yeah, I th this is such a funny, weird niche piece of science. Yeah. <laughs> It's kind of, there's a bit of it that's medical science. There's a bit of it that's social science. There's a bit of it that's chemistry. There's a bit of it that's engineering. And all of it can work together to make our lives more fabulous and better. Yeah. Better living through chemistry, engineering, and yeah. just science generally. And yeah. And I'm sure this kind of a method and this kind of, uh, will find other applications that, you know, yes. creative minds will start to see things a little differently. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, uh, Blair, I want to talk about Alan for a second. Oh, Alan. <sighs> Alan, do you remember all the things that Alan is responsible for? Yes, the destruction of animal society. <laughs> right. Alan, artificial light at night is pretty much responsible for a whole bunch of issues in birds, in just wildlife in general. Insects, I think, was the last story that you brought, Blair, talking about uh, talking about the impacts of Alan. And now Alan has to go and affect plants, too. Of course. Of course. Of course. Because, I mean, what what is it that's important to plants? Uh, photos. Oh, the Light and water and microbes. Right. But light is very, very important to plants' life cycles. Plant circadian uh, cycles are essential to when they decide to put out new leaf buds, when they decide to release their pollen, when they decide to turn golden colors in the fall. And... A new paper out of Iowa State University published in the journal PNAS Nexus has shown that Allen is responsible for more pollen. Uh, we have so allergies are potentially being made worse because of Allen. Uh, additionally, the reasoning for this is that Allen is making spring start earlier for plants. So urban plants grow new leaf buds earlier mm. when they're exposed to urban light. Uh, and the fall season, the golden, the, the dropping of the leaves and the changing of the colors starts later than it normally should because we are in our winter season adding all of our Allen to the environment. Oh, one more Alan. Time. What, is, what does Alan stand for again? Artificial light at night. Artificial light at night. Okay. Yeah. We did Alan it. Affix, affects me if somebody leaves the light on and I'm trying to go to bed. So I get it. Yeah. I mean, well, we've talked well, before. I, I, yeah. About the, you what, when you have a cloudy night and how the city glow underneath the clouds oh, makes it yeah, brighter. Yeah. And how full moons, people act crazy. Crazy. What? <laughs> because the light balance isn't what your circadian rhythm wants. So in, in Denmark right now, uh, somebody keeps leaving the sun on <laughs> until almost midnight. And then they, then they like turn it off, but then they just turn it. It comes back on at like four o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Oh, so you're, the, almost, the you're almost to the, the solstice. Yeah, the plants Thank in you. Denmark are used to that. <laughs> and they know when that's supposed to happen. So this this is exactly it, right? Is that if you have artificial light on and you're in Denmark and it's, you know, March, 
the the plants could go oh it's june <laughs> yes. you release a bunch of pollen so- yep yeah so alan it's impacting our allergies but even beyond that it's impacting the plants in our urban environments and again the ecosystem view it's affecting animals and insects and all sorts of things who re- rely on the plants that we're putting in our urban environments so pff, alan we should we should turn the light off on Alan a little bit more. Uh, Justin, when you're in the dark, though, you can do something like echolocate. Can we do that? Yeah. So this is this is research conducted by scientists at Durham University, UK, University of Birmingham, UK, Eidhoven, University of Technology, Netherlands and Placentia, USA. They've uh, worked together on this and discovered for the first time that human echolocators, a thing that apparently really, really does exist, have better acuity in localizing a target from 45 degrees off to the side as compared to straight ahead. Hmm. Researchers tested localization abilities of nine blind adults, so it's not a really big group, but then I don't know how many echolocators proficient echolocators there are in the world. But this they had nine of them in this study who use the skill on a daily basis. And part of the utilization of the skill is making clicking noises mm-hmm. and then reading the, the room with them. Uh, so they discovered, they did some tests and they discovered that the echolocation performance drastically improved at the 45 degree mark as participants can take uh, can uh, can better locate targets based on echoing coming from uh, those sideways directions the research findings indicate that human echolocation echolocation and human regular spatial hearing might be governed by very very different principles because regular hearing is most accurate straight ahead it gets worse as a target moves further to the side in terms of determining where it is. Uh, Researchers point out that human echolocation uh, may be relying on completely different acoustical cues, that human spatial hearing, spatial hearing, has more facets to it than previously thought. The researchers also characterized and analyzed that clicking behavior of the participants. They found that Participants made quieter clicks when they receive stronger echo signals coming from sideways at 45 degree angles and make louder clicks than if it's if they're trying to find something straight ahead. <laughs> Full results of the study have been published in the journal Psychological Science. Lead author of the paper, Delore Thaler of Durham University, said there's still a lot to discover about human echolocation and about human perceptual abilities more generally. Our findings show that there are facets of human spatial hearing that we did not know before. Also, what I thought was very interesting, and researchers did too, they pointed it out, uh, uh, better ecolocalization uh, off to, uh, to the side as opposed to straight ahead is consistent with what they have seen in bats. Huh, huh bats, interesting. Bats echolocate better off at those angles than they do directly ahead. They, this is surprising because it's not the same system. Right, That's even right. being used. Uh, bats possess an anatomical and neural specializations that allow them to do echolocation in the way that they do at the level that they do, which humans do not have. I would like them to do the brain scans, though, and yeah. see what part of the brain mm-hmm. in the bat and then what part of the brain in these humans are... Is getting activated. Yeah. That'd be cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're saying they think it has to do with uh, a, pr- a process of, uh, a, a processing strategy it must must be part of this. That sensing has a similar strategy and the cues that it's looking for, even if the physical apparatus is like, I still don't know how. Have you ever tried to do this? 
there might there's there's probably some aspect of the 45 oh, degrees true. off of center that uh is important because we have our ears located on you know the two sides of our head so when something is straight ahead it is equidistant from mm -hmm. our ears whereas if it is off at an angle one ear is going to be hearing the click at a slightly different time than the other so it's going to be slightly offset and this is how uh yeah and so this kind of like very very slight you know but the distance of our head is actually that's a that's a length of time when you think about how long it takes for a sound wave to move a particular plate and then additionally because it's at an angle it's coming in the information that's reaching the two ears is going to be uh qualitatively different yeah, but why doesn't that work with sound then? Because it's different. Sound, right? We have a hard time. But we, we're not. The we're sound not. Is off to the side. Uh, but the echolocation, the, the the echo coming back for these echolocators, it's easier to tell when it's off the side. So there's something. That's what's weird. That's why it's so strange. And yeah. bats apparently uh, yeah. do it too. So, but we don't know the answer. That is no, the no. reason. I'm just put positing yeah, no, physiological reasons. But yeah, we I, don't know I, the I, answer, I, I but that's awesome. I completely agree. Because my first thing when I'm reading <laughs> is, is that, yeah, you just hear it. Because it's, yeah, because you got one ear on one side and one on the other. It's louder on this mm -hmm. side, or, but then it's, it's not. It's but not a click a is not necessarily the same as the click going out, general sounds. It's, so, it's the yeah. bounce off of it that they're registering. And that's the yeah. thing that I don't know that I could ever hear. If you practiced, you don't probably even know, could. know that it's a sound. So I was <laughs> looking, I was looking up, I remember hearing an episode of this American life about this. <laughs> um, and I looked and it was in 2015 and I found the episode. It's called Batman. Um, and so, uh, Ira Glass actually interviews somebody who does this and it is fascinating. So if, if anyone listening wants to hear kind of a, a first person account of what this is like, it's a, it's a that very interesting, interesting listen. Thank you. Yeah, for and that I think I, I think I saw something on uh, uh, Stan Lee's uh, amazing humans, whatever it was, uh, superhumans. Yeah. yeah. I think he also profiled the uh, echolocators on there. And, and it's one of those things where you watch it and you're like, that's really cool. If it's true, like, come it on, is. Stan, it is don't true. pull my leg. And it's something that really anyone can learn to do. But yeah, it's a skill, a learned wow. skill for sure. Superpower. I hope you all are learning lots from this episode of This Week in Science. That's right. This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for listening. If you're enjoying the show, please head over to twist.org and click on our Zazzle link. We have lots of goody goods for you and your friends that are very sciencey, very summery for those of you who are in the Northern hem Hemisphere. We've got sweatshirts for those of you who are in your, uh, your winter time. But head over, click on our Zazzle link over at twist.org and get yourself some Zazzle Twissy merch. All right, it's time for a little tiny COVID update. I need I need a sad trombone. <laughs> All right, news this week for COVID. Uh, there was news out this uh, last week. A study has come out potentially linking uh, the hepatitis what seems to be a hepatitis outbreak in young kids that we have thought was potentially linked to adenovirus infection, but it seems an Israeli study has linked it to previous COVID-19 infection. This needs to be confirmed. It is not uh, a final word on this at all, but it is a concerning link that has been brought up. Here in the United States, uh, the CDC does not believe that we have any unusual levels of childhood hepatitis at this current moment. So it's not um, something that is the same level of concern as it is in, in other countries that are looking at this potentially. Um, there's a question 
what happens if what happens if a pregnant woman is infected with COVID-19? What happens to the pregnancy? What happens to the child if they if the if the uh, pregnancy goes to term? We know from uh, previous studies that COVID-19 infection is a threat to pregnancies and that many pregnancies do not go to term if a woman is infected with COVID-19. A new study that's out in the JAMA Network's open uh, journal has looked at the one-year neurodevelopmental outcomes of infants, of mothers who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 during pregnancy, and they have determined that there is a increased risk of neurodevelopmental outcomes that are different from normal in mothers who were infected. Is this based on um, baby behavior or is this based on the, the physical aspects of the brain? This is baby behavior. So this is neurodeve okay. neurodevelopmental diagnosis. And so this is, you know, babies going in to mothers taking them in for a one year well checkup and uh, checking for normal reflexes, for normal responses to uh, to particular stimuli. And doctors have a whole battery of, uh, of tests they run to look for uh, abnormalities in neurodevelopment. And in this particular study, they uh, looked at uh, this cohort of 7,722 infants delivered during the pandemic, 222 of the mothers had a positive uh, SARS-CoV-2 test during pregnancy, made it to full term, and then uh, it was determined that they were more likely to receive a neurodevelopmental diagnosis in the first 12 months after delivery. This is even after accounting for preterm delivery. This is a uh, an early study. So what the what the researchers say they want to do is that so this preliminary evidence suggests that there need to be follow up studies to exclude confounding factors and to actually confirm this because this is correlation, not mm -hmm. causation. Uh, it's just something that has been noticed and so, noted. Here's my concern with mm -hmm. these this study. Uh, there's a heck of a lot of social factors that impacted babies that were born during COVID. A right. lot. Yeah. So that, that is impact. That's part of the question. We have the other questions about our, what were, was there food insecurity? Who were these women that were infected with COVID? Uh, are there um, socioeconomic differences? Are there, you know, what are the factors that are involved here? We don't know. Were there the babies are... super isolated and not exposed to other humans in early in yeah. the first year? And therefore, did that impact but that, their development? That's going to also be yeah. all babies born during the pandemic are going to be isolated. Yeah. Or more more are, than they normally more would. More than others. Yeah. yeah. But there's all sorts of weird things you could check too. Like, it, they're, they're, you need to make sure there's not a correlation between people who got infected by COVID and then were ultra careful with their baby and not out in the world. Yeah. You know, like there's, there's all sorts of things. of things that you could look at. So, so what you're yeah, talking about, I think they need also to look comes at all these to, things. I, I think what you're also uh, maybe, maybe hinting, hinting at or leading towards is uh, diagnosis bias. <clears throat> the ADD uh, will most often be diagnosed in children that are the youngest in their class. Uh, compared to their peers, they may s seem like they've got all this extra energy. Right, not but this is not. This isn't talking. kids that. This but, isn't kids that old. This is. This is one year. This is within the, my, the first my, year. Right. Of, my, of my point. My point, the, yeah. my point isn't about the age of the. My point isn't about the age of the children. My point is about diagnostic bias. Knowing that the child mother had you, been infected, then you're. Like, well, hey, why don't I, to be undetermined potential cofactor as, a, you know, there's like, I don't yeah. know. I don't, right. I'm, I'm yeah, not I sure about could, this. I think the Blair's point, I agree with, I agree with that. The uh, uh, researchers did It's a rare occurrence on the that... show. We have to acknowledge I've agreed with Blair. This is, this is a big deal. <laughs> acknowledge, yes, acknowledgements made. Um, 
The positivity during pregnancy was associated with greater rate of neurodevelopmental diagnoses in unadjusted models, as well as those adjusted for race, ethnicity, insurance status, offspring, sex, maternal age, and preterm status. Third trimester infection was associated with effects of larger magnitude. So there's some interesting things to be checked in on there uh, even further. And any illness Another... in a mother during pregnancy is also something to be concerned about. Yeah. yeah. Depending on yeah. when it happens in the pregnancy too. That's also yeah. 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 Big things to be looking at. Um, and, you know, we're all wondering, you know, what are the factors? We know the, the physical factors uh, that potentially predispose somebody to be more likely to suffer from severe COVID-19. But what are the other factors? Are there genetic factors in play? And so some researchers from the University of Sheffield have now done an analysis along with researchers from Stanford University of genetic factors and found more than 1,000 genes that are linked to severe COVID-19. Uh, particularly involved are those that affect the function of the natural killer, NK white blood cell. Mm -hmm. uh, the genes that are involved in how, uh, how that particular white blood cell responds um, seem to be very uh, involved in predisposing people. But now we know that there are more than 1,000 genes that can be involved in uh, leading to the development. So there are more specific factors that can be looked at than BMI or smoking yeah. status or, you know, those outwardly physical factors. So in and the future, it might, it, it could lead to treatments. It could lead to all sorts of other ways of looking at how we, how we deal with COVID. And this is just looking at how severe COVID is. It's not looking at whether you got COVID or not, right? Right. It's just the severity. So yeah. those people who are more likely to have mm -hmm. the bad outcomes. Yeah. There, might seen, have a... there have been other studies looking at how likely you are to get COVID because I know there are some people who um, mm -hmm. have been right next to people who got COVID, who live with yes. people who got and never get it. And so I know they're looking for genetic factors for that as well. There was, right. this was somewhat early on. It might've been during the lockdown. Uh, there was a story about a, an elderly woman. She was like in her seventies with uh, leukemia, which means lots of white blood cells, but they're not necessarily working, not necessarily functioning, uh, who had COVID for 90 days. She right. was positive and still expressing the virus, but never herself went through the ill effects. So the, the relationship this thing has with our immune system is exceedingly complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we're not the host that it was, was uh, it's used to, and we're not used to hosting it, and everybody's awkward at this part. Yeah, there's a wonderful article in The Atlantic right now uh, talking about negative test results and uh, how your negative test result doesn't really mean anything because we are at this point in the pandemic where we are no longer completely naive to the virus. Even if you haven't been infected, you've probably been vaccinated, depending on where you live. Um, and so people have some amount of immune response. And so there's a question for these, you with Omicron especially, why are we having all these negative tests? Negative test, negative test, ne negative test. Even though I have symptoms, I know I was exposed, but I've had negative tests and maybe I don't get a positive test until the day that I start feeling better. What is up with that, right? What's happening? If you're taking tests over four, five, seven, ten 10 days and they're negative, even though you know, you know you're positive. And then you finally get that positive test. There is, like you said, Justin, a very complex relationship between our immune system and this virus. And so the question is, if the, the, the answer to a lot of that is if you have symptoms, you shouldn't just be relying on a negative test. Mm -hmm. If you have any kind of symptoms, you're sick in some sense. So you should be adjusting your behavior because you have symptoms of something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just common sense at this point, I think. Yeah, just tell all the employers that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Right. Well, wear, uh, wear uh, your mask. Uh, it's all fine. Right. But anyway, risk yeah. jeans. Some of these jeans might help us understand stuff later. I don't want to talk about COVID anymore. Do you want to talk about COVID anymore? Should we move no. on? N- yes. No. Yes. yes. <laughs> you do? No. Yes. No. no. Yes. You, you gave me the both options. To no, say no, comma, yes. yes. No more COVID. Yes, move on. Yeah. Moving yeah. on up. This is This Week in Science. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. Head over to twist.org and click on our Patreon link. If you enjoy this show so much that you uh, enjoy it every single week, maybe help keep the show going. It's your support that does keep us going. We are listener supported and we would appreciate your help. It would really do a lot to keep us going through these summer months, fall months, winter months, all the science months, all the science months. Twist.org, click on the Patreon link. Patrons at $10 and more a month will get thanked by name at the end of the show. And now let's come back to that wonderful, wonderful part of the show that's full of animals. And this week, a guess is again full of the ocean. Whales, tails, and all the things. It's Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair! What you got, Blair? Um, I have, I have whispering whales. Whisper, whisper. Did you know that female southern right whales, these are 50 foot long whales, will often choose to bring their babies into 30 foot shallow waters? They each winter will migrate by the thousands to bay habitats to give birth and care for their young. Why do they choose this teeny tiny space (laughs) to have their babies and to help raise them on their way around basically the whole world? Syracuse University's Bioacoustics and Behavioral Ecology Lab. There's a um, there's a clue in the name of the research institution recently uncovered a new potential motive. What could it be? (laughs) They hypothesize that shallow, sandy, near shore waters are a prime spot for whales to birth and raise their young because those areas have reduced acoustic propagation, which means their, their vocal signals won't travel as far. So there's less chance of eavesdroppers. They're hiding they the babies. babies. Yes, exactly. So this sheds some new light on their migratory behavior and also could potentially allow research to better focus conservation and management efforts since, you know, all whales need our help. They gather data at three nursery sites across three continents in the Southern Hemisphere. That's in South America, Africa, and Australia. And they found the depth at which right whale mothers and their young are often observed. And that depth, has the most limited acoustic detection range for their calls. Um, So previously, southern right whales have been shown to use three forms of acoustic crypsis. That is a way that an animal may change sound production behavior to reduce detectability by eavesdroppers. Acoustic crypsis. They have been shown before to use three different types. Reduction in call amplitude, that's a nice whisper, using signal frequencies that are difficult for eavesdroppers to detect and or localize, that's like really high or really low, where other animals maybe don't totally understand what they're saying, and also reduction or ceasing of acoustic signal production, that's just like not talking like in a quiet place, right? So effectively going silent. Um, So these three types of acoustic crypsis have been known about in a few different types of animals, but specifically in Southern right whales. This study proposes a fourth method of acoustic crypsis, which is all about habitat choice. They pick specific locations where they can hear each other, but other animals can't hear them. So specifically avoiding eavesdropping by finding a place where their calls don't carry as far 
gives a new parameter to this ecological term of acoustic crypsis. Yeah, that makes good sense. Especially if you haven't taught the baby whales to, you know, shush. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that whale whisper? Oh, I talked mm-hmm. over it. I gotta play it again. That's audio of a southern right whale call recorded in shallow waters off the coast of Brazil by Julia Ze from Syracuse University. There you go. Yeah, so the idea that some water carries sound better than other water. Now maybe I kind of want to go into a pool and start making sounds in the shallow end of the pool versus the deep end of the pool and see how it's well, different. Yeah, well, you need what you're going to need is a, one of those really neat landscaped pools that they have in places like resorts on Maui where you you go and they've got all the land, the features. So there's the, the shallow pool with the, where the little kids can play. And then there's the deeper pool and they've got stuff in between that could block sound. So what I'm hearing is. you could just go in the ocean. (laughs) Twist wants to fund a trip to Maui to try this technique. Got I think it. this would be very valuable research by this team. Great. I think I think I will agree with that for no <laughs> other uh, selfish reason than uh, the thing that you were talking about there. You know, we're research. gonna we're gonna pull up to the resort. We're gonna try out the pool with some tools. Mm-hmm. We're gonna That's scoot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you you you'll scoot. I will stick around for yeah. a nice frosty beverage. I mean, scoot as in, you know, give it a few days. Got to gotta get over the jet lag before you pull back. You know, anyway. anyway, um, Yeah, so right whales using shallow waters as a tool to hide their babies acoustically. Love it. Smart. Now, we know the whales are super smart. So the big question is, is this learned? Is this evolutionary? Do they just know? Is this, yeah, did somebody make them, you know, oh, this is a great place to hide the babies. Now everybody This is does a great it. question especially since this behavior is hardwired into their migratory pattern. So this is something that most likely has been taught to them over many generations. So when when this first started happening, was it just selective pressure that less babies got et when they went into the short, the shallow water? Mm -hmm. Or was this something that they were like, Oh, I'm going to go over there. It's actually better. So it's (laughs) tough, tough to say. So I would imagine out of all of the creatures in the sea, there's probably not one that better understands the properties of acoustics than whales who communicate with sound over really great distances or right next to each other in their communications. It's probably a thing that they understand better than anything else in the ocean. Yeah, probably. Although they've been in the ocean the least long. I yeah, but they but they you. come yeah. from a they come from an, being a a creature that did rely at one point uh, on audio much more so than uh, the fishies in the sea. Yeah, you talking about bats? You know, whales no, no, and no, bats no. are pretty closely no. related. I'm, Very I'm closely. Talking, yeah, and right whales about, uh, coming from land and using audio, and then moving to the ocean and continuing to use audio in a way that creatures already in the ocean aren't using it that's what i mean so so the the so even though they've been there less long the experience with using audio communication i think is greater than anything else in there. Mm-hmm. not that no fish ever has does this but not not like a whale come on now i want to know what cows do all right let's move on moving on to seals <laughs> and how they hunt underwater. So directly related to this, toothed whales often hunt in aphotic zones, deep, deep, deep down in the ocean. And they are able to use biosonar or echolocation to find their prey. So exactly what we're talking about. All the stories are coming together. Yes. But how, how in the deep ocean blue do seals find their prey in the dark waters because they don't echolocate how do they do it it's the whiskers Mm -hmm. Whiskers. 
Wiggle your whiskers. Okay, well, unlike humans, most mammals have vibrissae, which are mobile facial whiskers. Now, some oh. humans have what we call whiskers, but they're not mobile. You can't kind of wiggle your your face and have your mustache kind of flip up and back down. <laughs> oh, that would be that would be awesome. But not most without mammals... moving your entire upper lip, or yeah, yeah I would I would like actually that. grow facial hair just to be able to emote with with it with the whiskers. Yeah, yeah, it would be great. So would I. Anyway, um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Most mammals have vibrissae, which can do that. They can move around. Um, it's it's the Latin word vibrio, which means to vibrate, which is so fun. Anyway, so the vibrissae, until now, researchers were not sure how the natural movement related to an actual function for these mammals. It's really hard to observe whisker movement and measure it in a natural environment and see the direct impact of the movement of the whiskers. So what researchers did is they placed small video loggers on free-ranging northern elephant seals. Elephant seals are a really good choice because they have highly sensitive whiskers, but also because they go so deep in the ocean for so long. So those things combined made them a perfect study for the whiskers. They uh, they also have the highest number of nerve fibers per whisker of any animal. Elephant seals are so cool. Mm. Everyone, when you are That's... done here, Google elephant seals. Read up on them. There's so much more to them than the nose. That's really fascinating because as a neuroscience student, you just always learn about the mouse and the rat barrel cortex mm -hmm. where in the brain, in, there are these little barrel cortices. They look like barrels in the brain and each one corresponds to a whisker on the face of the rat. So it's just amazing to me that the seals, the, this, the sea lions are even, even more tied in. Kiki, it sounds Giant. like you got to crack open an elephant seal brain and and look at the barrels. No, no, I don't need to do that. I I, I can let someone else do that. It's okay. Probably someone or I can just has. appreciate them from afar. Yeah, you could probably look it up right now. Um. Anyway, the the researchers mounted video loggers on each seal's cheek to observe how the seal moves and um and how they use the whisker. They watched them forage in extreme environments, which is the deep, dark ocean. The logger was equipped with an LED red infrared light flash, which was designed to not be visible to the seal, but instead to allow the researchers to non-invasively observe how the seals were using the whiskers. The seals captured moving prey by sensing water movement, they found, based on the... Um, readings of these instruments and their whiskers extended forward ahead of their mouth when they sensed things nearby they performed rhythmic whisker movement protracting and retracting their whiskers to search for hydrodynamic cues so they were they were basically trying to find the 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 water movement of the fish nearby so like oh something's moving over there so they were able to search for their hydrodynamic cues with the whiskers which is how, uh, which is very similar to how terrestrial mammals use their whiskers when they're they're trying to sense things going on around them. They did try to take into consideration the possibility that bioluminescence could help them see where some prey is, but they they found that while bioluminescence can be used, the whiskers were their primary method that they used to find prey. The bioluminescence was not the main thing that they used. This does solve a decade-long mystery about how deep-diving seals locate their prey without biosonar. And so this also helps reveal another mammalian adaptation to complete darkness. Now, we know mammals in general, we know if they're nocturnal, they have big whiskers. So we already know whiskers are related to darkness. But this was a measurable way to see how underwater mammals use the whiskers to navigate darkness. So the next step of this study is to conduct comparative field studies on other mammals. So to bring it back to the, to the land side, to better understand how whisker sensing shapes natural behavior in different mammalian species in different environments. So basically they want to take these tools. They were effective in measuring whisker movement and what they used it for and start mounting them on chinchillas and rats and, and all sorts of things. Hippos, you know, Everything Hippo with whiskers. whiskers. Yes. I bet hippos use their whiskers for interesting things. Mm -hmm. mm. They are nocturnal. 
So there you go. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Wow. So these, okay. So these, these seals, they're really, they're each whisker is really tied into water movement to the, what happens, where the prey is going, slight changes, just so sensitive that they can navigate in the dark. And it reminded me actually of um, whisker feel. alligators. They have yeah. extra sensitive um, structures in their in their jaw and uh, around their mouth, so they can feel movements in the water. So mm. this is this was what might be considered a convergent trait used to to sense water movement, so they can get fish snacks. Fish snacks. Yeah. That's amazing. It probably That's is convergent. As we're finding, so many things are. It's it's what works best for ecology. Mm -hmm. You can figure out the echolocation that we were talking about before and get some vibrissae going. You'll be like yeah. hypersensitive. Oh, you had... You'll know everything that's going on around you. If they had both, can you? I'm now I'm picturing uh, alligators with uh, with whiskers. Oh. <laughs> they'd be pretty cute yeah. so good they're already so cute <laughs> like catfish alligators yes. all right Blair is that it for the animal corner that is it for the animal corner tonight Justin would you like to tell us how to navigate in our own world with oh, science oh goodness so uh oh I got the wrong story uh, hang on hang on one here loading that's not Loading. okay here we go this is uh so in looking for stories for this week's show i came across this title out of washington university school of medicine in st louis the title of the study was suicide less common in states that passed medicaid expansion oh so medicaid expansion must be the thing that you need to look at when uh you know, uh, when you're thinking about suicide. So we've we've recently been talking about, as has everybody, about guns and gun laws and gun deaths. Uh, we've also talked about general mortality in red states versus blue states on the show. Uh, so I read the, so I dived into this study to see what they were talking about. And boy, it was, that was, it was a mistake. <laughs> kind of got, I kind of got, I almost got angry at the study. You know, oh, no. just reading it. So, okay. According to the study, deaths by suicide have been on the rise everywhere in the U.S. over the last 20 years. Researchers tracked suicide rates in all 50 states from 2000 through 2018, during which the period, uh, period there was a half a million suicides in the United States, which is a staggeringly big number. Apparently, we do this more than other countries. Uh, states that expanded Medicaid eligibility. They started to do it in 2014. Researchers uh, focused on the post-expansion years 2015 through 2018 to compare it to before. Before expansion, suicide rates were already 16% higher in states that later refused healthcare expansion. Now, Suicide rates have been increasing. It's not just uh, the, the rate of suicide in the United States has been going up. It was, it's been going up 1% a year in the early 2000s, and then it started going up 2% a year. So it's, it's a serious problem. Before expansion, suicide rates are already 16% higher in these states that later turned down or refused to do the healthcare expansion. That rate was... 17% after uh, uh, the other ones, uh, then the ones that expanded later after the period. So after 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, they moved on to being 17% higher rate of suicide as opposed to 16% rate of suicide, which the researchers said was statistically significant uh, in that the, this was a correlation between healthcare and access to mental health services uh, that has prevented these suicides. Uh, but it doesn't really show that, does it? All it actually shows is that if you separate out some of the deep red states, 
Suicide rates in this case that are increasing everywhere are rising a little higher there. They're already rising a little higher in red states. So if you just take a group of deep red states that turn down Medicaid expansion for political reasons, whatever, you should get that result. If you if you did the same study, the problem is that this is a correlation. If you did the same study and said, I want to see how marijuana legalization uh, uh, and and uh, affected uh, suicide rates. You'd see right. in that same grouping that there's more uh, there's more marijuana legalization on one side than the other. Therefore, it must be that. Or you could turn it around and say access to health care leads to more marijuana legalization and more use of drugs. Right? You could come up with all endless ridiculous decisions on cause and effect on a two-point correlation where you already had all of the data and could have put in all of the data from all of the other aspects that are in there. So part of the point the authors are trying to make is there's a correlation between healthcare and suicide in terms of access to mental health, which makes sense because the authors were psychologists. They're missing the point. The overriding issue statistically driving suicide rates is not mental illness. It's guns. There are plenty of red states that signed up for uh, expanded health coverage, some that have greater or lesser uh, levels of gun use in, in blue states. Suicide rates are highest with the highest gun ownership states. And it's staggeringly high. So looking at Medicaid. But that expansion, also is a correlation. Right. It is also a correlation. So if, but if you're looking at Medicaid expansion loan, you're seeing the results of the, those state policies based on that one issue. You're in danger of misfocusing the attention away from the root cause. It's not healthcare, it's access to guns. The states with the highest rate of suicide in the U.S., the state with the most is Wyoming, and it did not expand Medicaid, which looks like a good data point uh, for the, what the researchers uh, and eventually concluded. But that state also has the nation's highest rate of gun ownership. Now, this is where this is where statistical significance of your correlation is the thing I'm talking about. Right. They have separated out this one group and they found this one percent change difference over this period. Uh, here we go. So Alaska and Montana both did expand Medicaid but they rank just below Wyoming in gun ownership and suicide rates. And the rates are significantly different. California, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Illinois are states with the lowest suicide rates. They are also states that expanded uh, Medicaid. But more importantly, they are the states with the strictest gun laws and some of the least gun ownership. So I think what's, what's happening here is there's a lot of factors that are... Uh that are going to be conflicting. There's going yeah. to be, uh, you know, like you're saying, there's just a lot of factors. That no, there's they, not. You know, there's not a lot go, of factors. They go hand there's in, not. They go hand in not. hand. There's not a lot. Here it is. The they, only I'm way, getting, the only way to it. prove causation is to manipulate a single variable. Right. So what yeah. you need to do is take Wyoming, don't change anything about mm -hmm. social structure or... Uh, Medicaid or whether it's a red or a blue state, don't change anything at all. Don't let anyone move in or out. Right. <laughs> but give more and, gun regulation. Right. And regulate And then guns. do the opposite. So yeah. Yeah. To yeah, to another state that has the issue. Right, well, let me Medicaid get to the let me get to the other. numbers yeah. part because because let's talk about statistically significant uh data. The majority of gun deaths in the United States are by suicide. Most of them. 54% of people killed by guns. But are the majority of but what is the what is the percentage of suicides by gun? That's what I just said. Fifty four percent. No, you. That's the percentage of gun deaths. Let me that let me suicide. start it over. Gun the deaths majority... that are suicides are not necessarily the same thing as suicides that are caused by gun death. Like we're looking, that's two different data points. Wait, wait, right. say that again because I think you just said the same thing. <laughs> the percent. So so you are talking about the percentage of gun deaths that are suicides. Kiki is asking what the percentage of suicides are that are gun by guns. I think that's the same thing. It is not um, the same thing. It's not thing. the same thing. 
that's going to be a different number and it's Wait it's a, a different analysis. A I'm, hang on. All right. Okay. Let me, let me focus in again. Say it again because I somehow have missed it. The percentage of gun deaths that are suicides uh-huh. versus the percentage of suicides that are gun deaths. Ah, gotcha. So, correct. Correct. So, 54% nationwide of, of suicides are, are, of gun deaths are suicide. Right. Suicide is the leading cause of a gun killing somebody. Mm-hmm. 54%. Now, when what you're talking about is what percentage of suicides themselves are by gun. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. So I got that. And that's that's the number that gets really significant. Majority of all suicides used a gun to commit the act, right? Rates of suicide by gun are the highest in states with the highest rates of gun ownership. The major threat then to somebody in a crisis is not whether or not they have access to mental health services through Medicaid expansion programs that allow them to make an appointment to see a healthcare worker specialist at some point. It's whether or not they have a gun in their hand while they are considering suicide to even begin to frame it in any other way i think is is tough so here's what you're asking uh in alaska and montana which did expand medicaid they have two of the highest rates of gun ownership in the united states 54 percent and 66 percent of people have guns own guns In New Jersey and New York, which also expanded, they have some of the lowest rates, 15 to 20 percent gun ownership. Alaska and Montana have suicide rates by gun that are 750 percent higher than in New York and New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Now, if you just look how much what's the difference in suicide rates, it's about Mm -hmm. three, four hundred percent. So it's, it's already three to four times more likely for somebody to commit suicide in uh, Montana and Alaska. But it's 750% more likely that mm-hmm. they will have used a gun. So this is, the, this is the main mechanism involved in suicide. It's, it's the, the 1% variable difference between, you know, somebody with Medicaid or does access to this is not it's statistically significant meaning that that number is different but it's not socially significant it's not Mm -hmm. it's not solution significant in any way and i I thought that it was particularly bad timing even if you had done this correlative study that pats yourself on the back and says that you're important to a, a big social problem putting out the paper while we're doing gun legislation Mm-hmm. In the wake of all these deaths and to say, hey, uh, here's a study that you can say is significantly is statistically significant that says access to mental health plays a role. No, it does play it's a access- role. It and not, that's, not that's really. what's frustrating. Not, that not, is, not bring this, that is what, this is what's this is what's frustrating me is that you are. Yes, these are these are related issues. They are related. Gun regulation, having access to guns. Mm-hmm. Is as, as the data shows that you have provided here is a primary factor in the ability of somebody to commit suicide. But before that, there is if there is access to mental health, if there is access to uh, Medicare, Medicaid, things that have been expanded, right. um, if then you have preventative services, you know, so these things do go hand in hand. They are not all by themselves. And sure. I, so you, I but don't think about, arguing talk- one without the other is, you know, it. I, and yeah, I think that's I, I yeah, they're important I think because that's the, that's the frustrating part for me. You, you, okay. you you're correct showing, that you want to pre- you want to prevent a, Justin. You want to prevent <laughs> you want to prevent the ability to carry through with the act, right? I understand that, but there is still an underwhelming issue of someone having suicidal thoughts or facing suicide as a problem, also. And I think that's what Kiki's getting yeah, at, right? Is that like you you, not... you want to make it harder for people to go through with it when they are facing yeah. crisis? Yes, uh-huh. but in you that also need moment. to care for people in crisis. 
Yes. You need to be able to do both. And that's where I am also understanding what you're saying, Justin, is that it is insanely frustrating that there are people out there who want information to prevent doing both. They want to use it as an or, not an and. Mm -hmm. It's not or. It's and. We need so both. So I'm not trying to discount the need for mental health, but... Make it, doing a correlative, again, that you could have done by any sort of basis of knowing the difference between a deep red state and the rest of the nation, you could have said that access to mental health care leads to greater drug use. You could have said that just as easily, right? You could come up with anything you want, but when you have uh, New Jer uh, Wyoming having a thousand times higher rate per capita than New Jersey, a thousand percent higher rate of yeah and talk about there's, if they only had access to a little bit of health there's something rotten in the state I of denmark stop it. so i know denmark's fine denmark doesn't <laughs> uh it's i, I mean i gosh uh, wyoming i didn't realize this about wyoming until looking into this wyoming must have the highest suicide rate in the world if you took it as a standalone versus any country it's staggering, Lehigh. Like I don't, you know, and the people from New Jersey have got really low suicide rates, and they live in New Jersey. It just the world just doesn't make sense. There was the also world some, does not make. There's also some other interesting things about that gun ownership. When I was looking at this per state, correlated to gun deaths almost perfectly. Uh, what was really interesting is that uh, Wyoming has one of the lowest murder rates in the nation. <laughs> one of the lowest per capita murder rates, but their death by gun is still one of the highest because it all turned into suicides. And there's some places like Maryland, they've got almost no suicides per gun owner kind of a situation going on, but they have a really high murder rate. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But it, because they have less guns overall, the death by gun rate is much lower. Than these yeah. states that have so it, it that tracks very well. I don't know. I got really irritated because it's it looked like a very self-serving, uh, biased uh, study, and to put it out at a time when there are false claims that yeah. gun deaths and violence is a mental health issue and not a gun issue, it very clearly isn't. When 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 somebody is at their weakest moment in life and they have a gun in their hand they are their likely outcomes are very different than if they did not have a gun in their hand and i don't think most people realize that most of the guns gun deaths in the united states are suicide i i didn't know that until until looking at this yeah there's some definitely some uh numbers to look at in there yeah. And it, and it goes. It All is, right. This it is, is it's important. These are important things to talk about. Uh, but I do want anyone out there who knows anyone or is personally in crisis or might be considering any aspects of self harm uh, to get in touch with the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. There are. Uh, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline website. There's a phone number that you can call. Uh, but, and before 988, you do that, 988 oh, oh. has been designated as the new three digit dialing code that will route callers to this lifeline. In the before you, before in the you do States. that, though, get rid of your gun. Yes. If you own one and you know you're having trouble, get it the heck away from you. Get it, get it far, far away. Is that it for your section of the show, yeah, Justin? Done. You're done. Well, I got some brains for everyone, so oh, good. Time. Hopefully, we can we can bring it back up with a with some lighter lighter topics. Um, are we born knowing right from wrong? Are we born with a moral compass? If we see another individual hurt someone else do we know from early on that that's bad 
Yes. When do we learn these things? How do we put them together? <laughs> so researchers uh, published this from Osaka University, published in Nature Human Behavior, their study that I find so fascinating because, I mean, the, the bottom line is that they made eight-month-olds look at a computer screen with little animated not little animated little heads with eye like squares with eyes on them to make them look kind of humanish yuck animalish and had the babies watch one of these little humanish animated things go and push another animated little thingy and then by staring they could destroy the evildoer it's by staring for a long period of time, like eight seconds, 10 seconds at the pusher, it would the, then the little computer screen would drop a block on top of the, the evil doer. It's huh. this to me is just a, a fantastic experiment <laughs> by these researchers using eye gaze in preverbal children, eight month olds, uh, to determine whether they know right from wrong. And they uh, did a whole bunch of, of var var variations on the experiment to figure out whether or not this is really what was going on in little babies' brains. Um, so in the end, the result is that, that, yeah, at the age of eight months old, a baby can look at one humanish little block eyeballed character on a computer screen doing harm to another and no and and destroy them with their mind <laughs> the babies the babies who the babies in this experiment more often than not destroyed the wrongdoer in this situation um huh. which is fascinating i mean by a month old eight months old babies are starting to get a sense of the world they definitely are communicating through movement and they've got interactions with you and the rest of the world. Um, you know, and I, I wonder, is this instinctual or is this learned? And because by eight months, the babies have had eight months of their parents or other caregivers saying, don't do that. Don't push your brother. Or if they have siblings, don't, don't, don't hit the baby, you know, the, don't pull things. the cat's tail. Don't pull the cat's tail. Yeah, there's all sorts of all behavioral modifications that are already going on by eight months of age. Um, and then in this study situation, the researchers, though, based on the results, they suggest that an early understanding of morality is hardwired into our into our brains, into our behaviors. Maybe it's just hardwired for easy learning, um, but it's hardwired in because it would uh, would would help us survive. Would have helped us survive evolutionarily. So they're kind of giving it an evolutionary psychology kind of explanation that has led into this. But yeah, it's an interesting question. So if you look at primates and especially great apes, there's it's a very social structure. There's lots of social interactions. Mm -hmm. And those interactions start from an extremely young age. And so it would it would track for these things to be hardwired so they act appropriately inside of a troop from essentially day one. Right. What I'm confused about with this experiment design is this doesn't sound like morality to me this sounds like corporal punishment <laughs> you do something bad you get destroyed <laughs> that's kind of scary to me <laughs> well there i mean there's not gonna be much much room for nuance in the right. eight month old brain i, I think yeah. oh i don't know about that <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would like to see something where it's like th there was an, an uneven allocation of things somehow, right? But I guess that's hard to convey. But 
this is this is just so strange as a as a design because it it does involve like judgment and inflicting yeah. harm, which is yes. is I would argue is very different from morality and a sense of right and wrong. So the you know the question is you know yeah there were no controllers there was just tracking eye gaze so you know I am putting I am definitely putting thoughts in the the eight, eight month old brain of destroying the evildoer mm -hmm. i will cop to being a little you know not being completely scientifically unbiased here um the eight month old is potentially going to be more interested in what's going to happen to the evildoer the wrongdoer Maybe it doesn't believe that it's destroying. <laughs> Maybe it's agreeing <laughs> that it, that with. That it is inflicting punishment because all it's doing is looking. And yeah, the baby maybe has learned that it looks, if it looks at the wrongdoer long enough, that something that something will happen to it. But the, the cause and effect is not necessarily in their brain. Necessarily. What were you we, going to say? We, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, it just it seems more. Uh, maybe it's just more fascinated by the by the evildoer. Like, yeah, I got to watch that guy. He seems to know how to things work around here. Or it's the I need to watch the wrongdoer and watch out for them. That yeah. that wasn't. Or there's something not okay. Or there's something different. And so we know that animals. We know that babies extend the length of their gaze how long they look at something when there's novelty involved when there's something unexpected mm -hmm. when you know so this is an individual doing something that the baby did not expect yeah so rod Hagland in the um in the chat room in youtube is saying are they punishing evil or eliminating a threat which is exactly what you're talking about is it are they are they passing down judgment because they were mean or are they going, oh, God, I got to pay attention to this guy. He's mean. <laughs> He's going to hurt I me. Gotta, I have to just pay attention. Or I, I think that they, was I that, think they're competing. why they do that. What just happened just, there? I think they're competing. You want to be you want to you don't want to be the runt and you got to you got to take out the competition. That's who you know. That's how you do it. Hmm. It's a baby eat baby <laughs> world out there. Next thing you know, we're going to have a little posse of eight month olds who grow up to just stare awkwardly at people and you know that they're thinking about mind control I don't punish want to squish you with, you with the <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, but the the uh, experimental design for this is very fascinating and it's yeah very oh. interesting question how early do babies know these things what's good what's bad what's wrong what's right they're interested, that's for sure. Moving on to more brainy things, because you know how much I like the brainy things. Let's talk about our brain temperature. Do you think that your brain temperature is the same as your body temperature? Oh, I always kind of assumed everything on the inside is all the same temperature. Yeah, I've never no. given any thought to it at all. Right? You don't necessarily think about it so much. But according to this new study that is in brain communications, uh, researchers have analyzed using, um, using magnetic thermometry. They've been able to use magnetic resonance spectroscopy to determine the internal temperature of brains and it's what they've looked at they've determined that your brain's temperature varies throughout the day that it tends to exceed your body temperature by about one degree celsius uh, of 100 patients who were eligible for brain temperature rhythm analysis 25 displayed daily rhythm and the brain temperature range decreases in older patients. So the older patients had lower temperatures inside their brain. But yeah, overall, the brain temperature exceeds, hmm. overall, the brain temperature exceeds your body temperature. So why, 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 why 
are they interested in this? Well, it turns out, according to their uh, their analysis, that patients whose brain temperatures were less likely to vary during the day and were very stable during the day, they were less likely to survive brain injury. And so we also found that women who were post-ovulation had higher temperatures than pre uh, ovulation or during menstruation. Um, so, and women often had higher brain temperatures than men. So there are very interesting variations in brain temperature. And when we do brain surgery, very often the whole goal is keep it cool. Don't let inflammation happen. Don't let, uh, don't let the brain and just don't let the brain temperature change. But the reality is that a healthy brain does change its temperature. It's hotter than the body's normal temperature, and it varies throughout the day, and it varies according to a woman's cycle, and it varies between men and women. So there's a lot going on that could help in the treatment of brain injuries and could help people with traumatic brain injury perhaps recover better if we understood this more clearly. Wow. <laughs> Right? You're like, oh, my brain. Of course, it's this body temperature. There you go. No, it is not. And it changes, which is fascinating. A whole new field of research. Go have fun, postdocs. <laughs> <laughs> you could stick a thermometer in it. Well, no, don't go do that. But yeah, I mean, this, I'm sure you could. You could, but the spectroscopy of the brain, it's fantastic. <sighs> How do you feel when people uh, wake you up when you're sleeping? And they're like, I've been sleeping. And, and, and then they wake you up and you don't get good sleep. How, how does that make you feel? I wasn't expecting uh, to be woken up is what you're saying? Grumpy, yes, grumpy. you are not. Nope. Uh, so what's, why is the world I'm signing up for this? I was Sometimes. Light. Who's, whose idea was light? Yeah. And sometimes I you get a... Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> I'm up. I'm up. What's wrong? Well, another of my favorite studies from this week uh, is published in Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Re Reviews. They uh, did a, a meta-analysis looking at what happens to people when they get woken up and they don't get enough sleep. And so according to their meta-analysis, sleep uh, or lack of sleep is associated with stress and aggression. And so then the researchers said, well, let's test that. <laughs> so oh, they dear. woke a whole bunch of people up a lot during their experiment, and it made those people stressed out and aggressive. <sighs> Ta-da, science. <laughs> science. <laughs> That's, yeah. That sounds correct. <laughs> Excuse me. These findings suggest that poorer sleep is associated with and leads to heightened levels of subjective stress and aggression. These findings and their implications are discussed in relation to neurobiological literature, which highlights the complex interplay between metabolic activity in the brain, hormonal changes, and behavior. I think uh, which leads sleep. rise to the old saying, I love you more than coffee, but not before. Not before. Let the sleeping people lie. Yes. I I I find it fascinating that this this question in particular was a point of inquiry. As <laughs> well, we are as well, so many of us know that our sleep is so important. So we know sleep's important. We know we shouldn't interrupt normal sleep patterns. We also know that like teenagers have specific sleep windows that are different from adults, which are different from young children, which are different from older adults. We also know that like there's very specific amounts of sleep that people need and all this kind of, but we're not going to change anything as a society. We're just going to keep demanding that everyone wake up at the same time and get the same amount of sleep and show up at the same time in the same place and expect the same kind of um, performance no matter what. 
No uh, matter what, even though the, Alan we... might have kept you up all night. Yeah. Alan. <laughs> well, that's because your employer wants you to there when they want you there, yeah. Blair. Yeah. And that's well, how having an employer works. That's how, that's how <laughs> jobs are. For our society. Mm. Oh, this whole loop back. Uh, but if Alan weren't a lot around... Maybe I'd learn to echolocate a little bit more. This brings us full circle to the fact that I'm not in Denmark. It's dark outside, and we have come to the end of our show. <laughs> Might still be bright as day in Justin's neck of the woods right oh, now. Oh, it's getting brighter. It's it's mm -hmm. getting brighter as we talk, yeah. But it is time for us to finish up this show so i would like to thank you all for joining us for another episode thank you for listening thank you for being here i hope you enjoyed it shout outs shout outs to fada thank you so much for your help with social media show notes show descriptions gourd identity for uh gourd Arn lore others for the chat room and keeping it happy in there uh, identity for thank you for recording the show and rachel thank you for your editing and assistance. Additionally, I, of course, would like to thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schofer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Levin, Pierre Velazar, Ralphie Figaro, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Korsfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vigard, Chef Stad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Styles, aka Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Grove Sharma, Ragan, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredus 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Vote Beto for Texas, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflo, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, aka Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Nappy, O, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul, Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you all for your support on Patreon. And if you would like to support us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. On next week's show. We will be back broadcasting Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time from YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Trying that again. Do you? Do you? Do you? <laughs> Maybe you will listen um, as you try to fan your brain to keep it nice and cool or I guess keep it hot or put a nice towel on it either way just search for this week in science or podcasts are found if you enjoyed the show get your friends to subscribe as well for more information on anything you've heard here today show notes and links to stories will be available via our website www.twist.org where you can also sign up for our bi-decadal newsletter I mean it'll come when you're least expecting it just keep an eye out. You can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. And don't confuse the suffixes on those emails because they're all different. Oh, Just man. put twist, T W I S, in the subject line of that email, or it will get spam filtered into a whispered whale song. <laughs> In the shallows. Hmm. Where it is no in doubt been reposted tens of thousands of time on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Flying, at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. <laughs> this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 
this week in science it's the end of the world so i'm setting up shop got my banner unfurled it says the scientist is in i'm gonna sell my advice show them how to stop the robots with a simple device i'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand and all it'll cost you is a couple of grand is coming your way so everybody listen to what i say i use the scientific method for all that it's worth and i'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. Ah, uh, you just might understand. Yeah. Woo-hoo. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for drinking. Oh, noodles. That is a cute little kitty gif. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Where did Justin go? He went away. Justin is in Denmark. Where are you? Something's rotten in the state of Justin. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, That was fun. Fun. Oh, here comes the desk lowering. I'm wearing my, (laughs) she's sitting again. Fabulous. I hope you're, I hope you enjoyed it, Paul. I hope we made your days end enjoyable, everybody. Every day is a new one, but every day's end can end at least once a week with twists. This is the end for this My week we'll again next week for twist the internet was weird today the internet was weird today there were a lot of hiccups we were stepping on each other a lot it was yeah. a bummer i did a speed test right before the show my internet was was great i don't it was it was very strange it just happens sometimes right like it doesn't sync yeah. up great there's nothing to be done about it Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you. Yeah, the internets. There's nothing we can do about the internets. We can do what we can do to make sure we have the good connection and we've got the things and the places that are supposed to be there. Mm-hmm. Make it the best that, from our perspective, we possibly can. But sometimes it doesn't cooperate, and that is what it is. Um, yeah, so the James Webb, they are going to have the first science images coming out in July. I think July 13th, 14th, I think they said, is when they're going to come out. Surprising. Yeah. After all of the hiccups with getting it up there, I kind of expected things to take longer. They're doing great. Yeah. Yeah. And they uh, apparently, July 12th, thank you, Gaurav. Um, apparently, one of its mirrors, see something or other, did get impacted by a little teeny, 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 tiny meteorite. Little tiny speck of dust in space. Oh, no. Yeah. Gaurav, I love that you marked it on your calendar already. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Fado was asking about the baby story earlier. Could it have been the baby was following the figure on the screen simply because it was doing the most movement? And that would be attracting the baby the most at that stage of the of development. No, because they did different variations in which uh, the, diff- the characters moved around in different ways to control for that kind of stuff. Mm. Different colors, different... 
Yeah. And they had babies who'd been trained up on another version come and play another version. Like, they, yeah, they did uh -huh. all sorts of reverse experiments uh -huh. and tested all that stuff out. They did science. They did science with babies, which is just awesome. Yeah. Justin, impressive. would you take your baby to do science and let them destroy little animated rocks with their minds? I can hear you. Are you muted? I see. Yeah, that totally sounds like fun. Uh, <laughs> would, yeah. I think that would be a lot of fun. Hey, baby, go stare at a screen. This is the only screen time you're going to get. Yeah, it's amazing how attractive a screen is uh, already. Uh, yeah. Where, where are we at? Uh, almost that? heading into heading into month five. It is. Is uh, it really month five already? I mean, I know this logically, mm -hmm. but emotionally, almost. I cannot believe it. Almost. Yeah. Wow, you're out of the first baby or the the fourth trimester. You're into like uh, the real getting into the fun in, baby uh, times. Heading into the fourth tooth. Huh? Oh, fourth Jeez. tooth. Oh my yeah. gosh. They're they're coming Somebody's quick. Toothifying quick. Yeah. Oh my yeah. goodness. Month five and six, I think that's when I was like, "Ooh, you're really fun now." <laughs> uh, he's already a blast. Yeah. He's already, he's already a fun guy to hang out with. A fun guy. Yeah. Don't call your baby a mushroom. Wow. His mother did get a degree in fungal genomics. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I like yeah. this humor. Justin, are you going to sleep today? Yeah, probably uh, uncontrollably <laughs> so. Uh <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I, so it's, it's now seven in the morning. The show started at five in the morning. Uh, yeah. I didn't sleep in the overnight. Uh, just, I'm, uh, when I go the other direction, uh, it's like, I, because I'm, I'm already a bit of an insomniac. I, I belong on a planet with like a 28 hour day is like probably just right for me. When I go the other direction, I have no problem with the 10 hour flight and it being the same time as I left. The rest of that day goes fine. I go to sleep at a reasonable hour. Perfect. Come back the other way and it's completely discombobulating. I've, uh, so yeah, I've, I've been uncontrollably day sleeping. You know, yeah. you get tired. Yeah. Cause it's that, it's that thing where you get tired and really try to like, fight oh, it. You know what? I'll just fight it. I'll have a cup of coffee and then, mm -hmm. oh, oh, wow. Maybe I'm going to nod off for a few minutes. Just close my eyes here. Ooh. Six hours later, ah, I did like the night sleep during the day. Oh, gosh. And then the other day, <laughs> like a couple of days ago, I, I went to bed at the nighttime at a reasonable-ish hour. And I got a great night's sleep. Only it was uh, an hour and a half later. So <laughs> slowly, uh, it's like an hour. You're going to, you're going to march forward. <laughs> I'm taking my, I'm taking my, my little siestas uh, uh, in the night and I'm doing the, the full sleep during the day. But yeah, I might need to, I'm getting suggestions. I might need to do some, some melatonin. Melatonin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, uh, if or, I do it or, now. No, you'll I'm go gonna, to sleep. Yeah. I gotta, <laughs> no. <laughs> I got to keep drinking coffee until I either uh, stay awake long enough to go back to mm -hmm. sleep at a reasonable hour mm -hmm. or just have a heart attack. And, no, don't do that. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'd prefer you didn't do that. That's the other way of doing it. Yeah. So what you need to do is like at, I don't know, if you can stay awake I mean, maybe take a little nap if you can actually take See, a nap. See, that's, the, oh, that's, yeah. that's the thing. That's the thing. But you that's need to stay the... awake. You need to stay awake until like at least, what, like 7 o'clock? Sure. 7 o'clock? That sure. would be reasonable-ish. It's early, but that's a, that's, yeah. that's a time to make it to. Like 7 o'clock, yeah. 
close all of the drapes, make it dark. And then, um, so, it, so there's no light getting in and you take your melatonin and then you go to sleep and try and get as much sleep as you can. And then in the morning, you expose yourself to sunlight or to bright light, like first thing in the morning. And that'll help you start shifting it. Okay. But you have, yeah, it, but you take the melatonin before you go to sleep and that'll help before. you set the clock you and then you so wake up saying, and expose yourself to light and that will saying, set your I, circadian. Because I had to, I did, it takes was a few days. trying to do it wrong. That's what the problem is. Mm -hmm. I kept, I kept trying to uh, take it after I went to sleep and it just, I would forget. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, already asleep. That's not gonna so, work. <laughs> this time, this time, now I've got the advice from the good doctor. I will take the pill before before uh, you go to sleep. To sleep. See if that has a uh, yeah. It's <laughs> it's just so it's just I might like I don't even have to think about it going the other way. It's just like like there's no difference at all. Like nothing has changed. It's just fine. It's just this way. Yeah. Every time I, 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 um, I came back from Israel, I always thought I was fine. Mm -hmm. And then like three days later, you're like, oh, no. <laughs> I've done it now. I don't feel good now. I don't feel so good. Well, it's, I feel like it's the better me when I, when I uh, go from, from the east to the west. Because then I'm going to bed at like 8, 9 o'clock at night. I'm getting up around... Four or five in the morning. Yeah, that's a yep. good, uh, healthy farmer's way to start the day. Get up uh, before the birds are looking for worms or whatever. But then, uh. yeah. then you come back the other way, and I'm like, oh gosh, I, I'm awake all through the night. Like, this is like a meth addict living in this house now. Just doesn't sleep. <laughs> like a vampire meth addict not sleeping in the in a, a nocturnal vampire meth addict not sleeping through the whole night yeah and then... well you either need to like buckle down and like stay awake mm -hmm. as long as you can and like just start pushing just pushing that envelope or you know you just go oh i'm tired now and it'll take longer to adjust back if you just michelle kelly is saying if you have enough melatonin already it can Keep you, keep you awake and i've yeah. experienced that that that's one of the things too is i've experienced taking a melatonin pill and then just having like this weird nervous energy where i could not sleep no matter what yeah well um, the most important thing is the light first thing in the morning so when you wake up in the morning bright light you wake up the in the morning in the and you go outside and go, yeah. well, but what if what if i sleep with the lights now. on what if i'm sleeping with the lights on already then you got you've other problems <laughs> <laughs> Dang, Alan again. Oh, he messes with everything. Darn. Alan, Alan. go away. You Don't see like the, uh, I've, and, I've, and apologies I've, to any Allens out there. In stuck the world, uh, on this. The uh, internet stuck on I mean, system. Karen's had to deal with this for years. So <laughs> fine, now Alan. Alan has to deal with a little bit of hot water. Yeah. Sorry, mm. bud. Mm. Everyone tired again? Mm -hmm. What's going on? Yeah, what? What, Justin? Oh, never mind. I think oh, there was a story. Uh, <laughs> there was a story that I looked at that I didn't Rain bring. Working. That was sort of interesting. I was, well, I was going to see if I could pull it up, but the interwebs on this computer don't like it when I try to open a tab while we're doing the, the <laughs> live streaming. Uh, that showed... Children who had exposure to black carbon, specifically one of the puts of diesel, uh, who were in, had higher experienced higher air pollution in pre adolescence and, and as younger children, had higher rates of brain connectivity. Did you, did you come across that one, Kiki? Which, which, which ones had more? What, what was that again? I was looking at some overlay things. It was children exposed, uh, children exposed to, pollution. to pollution had greater had greater levels of brain connectivity. That's weird. Yeah. Very That seems 
Right. That seems like, yeah. I wonder what is behind huh. that. It's not a complete outcome. It's not a complete outcome story. It's not saying like that had a negative effect, a positive effect. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, brain scanning huh. stuff of uh, young children. And it had a greater connectivity in the, in the default mode and then mm -hmm. whatever the active mode or whatever that other mode is. I thought that was a. Okay. Uh, uh, that changes in brain connectivity. Higher exposure is associated with higher functional brain connectivity in pre adolescence. Exposure to traffic noise was not. So, right, which I thought was interesting because that was very much like the story Blair brought the uh, <laughs> last the week. Last week yeah. Mm -hmm. That was specifically academic performance, which I guess is different. Uh, well, I think this one might have been, that's why I was like, I also got confused about like, is this the study that Blair was talking about? Because they also were saying that it, the noise at home didn't have any influence on it. So I was like, is this connected to the same? Uh, I don't know if it was, was that a Dutch no. study last time? Uh, it was, it was South American actually. Interesting, because it was like, it seemed to be saying some of the same stuff as that other study. So I was like, is this the, did it come out the wrong week? Did I miss uh. a big part of the last one? Like it was, it, uh, it raised some doubts when I was, and then I found other stuff, but uh, we found, so maybe, you know, there's a good side. Maybe this is why the, the city kids are talking so fast. It's all that brain pollution. Oh boy. Yeah. Yikers. Yeah, they say they still need to, they, we still have to understand the consequences of this increased activity of both networks in resting conditions. But for now, we can say that the brain connectivity in children exposed to higher levels of air pollution is different from what we would expect. <laughs> yeah, well. So you know, there's an impact it, of nitrous oxide and, uh, and particulate matter. But I also wonder if there's a little bit of a bias against pollution, which we should be biased against. To some degree, there hasn't been a whole lot of, oh, yeah, exposure to chemicals. It turns out it's doing great things to our bodies. Hmm. Uh, no. <laughs> and also, I'm also, also always noticing that the, uh, what is it, the American Chemistry Association or whatever it is, never comes out with health warnings about chemicals. It always just talks about advances and ways that chemicals make life better. But these are, <laughs> these are sort of biases that are just out there. Yeah. Uh, but but I think, though, if, if we had looked at this, if this had been a study on the effects of eating a non-dairy organic diet and saw greater levels of brain connectivity, they would have said, hey, look, this healthy diet is associated with greater levels of brain activity and connectivity, not active, connectivity. And, and it would have been like, oh, wow, hey, let's all eat healthy and just move along. But the, the, the fact that they're like, they're like, oh, wait, we've seen a positive correlation potentially in these children's brain connectivity due to exposure to pollution. Wait, 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 wait a second. We're gonna, we need to look at this one. Look at this one a little harder before we say anything conclusionatory about it. Conclusionatory. I, I don't know if that's a word. It is not. I really like it's it. Probably not, but I'm going to. Uh, roll with it anyway. Take it. Yeah, and Michelle Kelly, could that extra activity cause anxiety, depression? Sure, but what if it just mm -hmm. makes them smarter? Could we like no, so are, could you hang on? Could you handle that? Could we could we as a society handle the fact that our exposure to black carbon that we've foisted under our children I'm actually gonna say made that's them... probably an inaccurate uh, conclusion. No, it is. <laughs> It is. It's all inaccurate conclusions, but that's the point. That's the point. We're talking about a, a correlation without looking at all the outcomes. Yeah. And and if we hadn't had it, been, if it hadn't been pollution, if that was eating blueberries shows greater connectivity in these two functioning connectivity in these two regions of the brain, we would have said, you know what? I've heard all I need to. I'm going to make sure my kid eats plenty of blueberries. But nobody right now, hopefully, is saying, you know what? I think I need I'm to expose move. my child to some diesel emissions. Because that, yeah. that would... <laughs> nobody... <Yeah. laughs> 
but because we have a, a maybe a healthy bias uh, in these situations. But I just I love those words of caution at the end of the. It's like, oh, uh, here's what we found. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Well, and this is like, this is also probably part of that, like, what's it called? Publish or perish kind of idea, too, that it's possible somebody's publishing this weird study before they can really do the 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 kind of the look back that they should yeah. because they need to finish their PhD, right? It's I don't know that, but that's possible, is that a lot of times things are published because they're like, I gotta publish something. Uh. That's dumb. As a map, everyone has right. biases. The whole point of the scientific method is to find ways to remove those from analysis. Right. Yes, I'm glad you said from analysis. I was like, I was expecting you to say remove the biases. Like, uh, Justin. Well, That's actually, not really remo- possible. <laughs> well, you 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 try to remove them. Uh, also, uh, the you try to remove the scientist's biases from the experimental conditions, right? And from the analysis, and it's mm-hmm. it's a it's the part of the gosh, one of the toughest things that is done in science, and it's why I was also picking on that uh, psychology study. Because I, I have, my experience is they're like the worst study offenders when it comes to bias. Uh, it's just, you don't, you won't see that as much in fields that have not, don't have to deal with humans, quite frankly. Like in now analyzing humans as a human this is just this incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, it's it's a tough job. I'm not trying to say that it, it's a ch- jam field, but gosh, sometimes it's just obvious that that somebody didn't didn't think. Well, some I mean, sometimes when things get published, like yeah, no, no. They they probably they might have mm-hmm. submitted it a while ago, and then the timing of publication. Yeah, they, but they were probably using current events for getting the word out more about their work. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. I want to make some overlays for. Well, and, and I guess also, if we're still talking about it. the thing is, like, too, is like if you're going to do an analysis, I get the idea that you you can break something down to this versus that to look for causational stuff, right? If you you're, you're sort of limiting the interactions and options of, of data that you're looking at, but you but you usually are going to do this to isolate down to a causal. You're looking for a mechanism. You're looking for causality. You're looking for uh, if we remove all these other factors, does this still happen? When you're doing it with data sets that are already in existence, then it becomes, that's when bias can really play in because you can limit yourself, you can limit contradictory information very easily uh, by tuning what you're focused on and tuning where yeah. you're going to look. And that's that's the thing that that seems to happen and then and then coming to conclusions off of correlations is also something that happens much more in uh in psychology than you will see in the medical field medical field you're like oh this leads to a like we're always making fun of this, the early cancer studies this is going to lead to a pathway to explore the idea that something in this <laughs> region that we were looking at might have something to do with it psychologists go aha Two data points, which is really, this was just data point. Not, it wasn't anything more than that. Two data points. Let's make conclusions about society and the role of our profession in it based on data points. A couple of them. So we've decided are significant. And also, by the way, when I was saying that one group is 1% higher than the other, that's in the, diff- that's the differences off of a number that's below 1%. 
It, I mean, it's significantly statistical in that it exists. Not statistically significant as a driver causational mechanism mm -hmm. to itself. It's still really irritating. <laughs> I'm picturing, I'm picturing, you got the, you got the guy coming out of the ambulance and somebody's like, uh, you know, uh, working a breather, keep him breathing. <laughs> And then there's a doctor who's like, oh, come over here. Let me give him a shot of this drug that'll restart his heart. And they're putting him, hooking up to the EKG. And then somewhere over in the background is also somebody in, in medical gear goes, did he mention anything about his mother? What was his relationship to his siblings? It's not important. Stop. We have a, me we have a heart attack. We have a big mechanism that we have identified that's associated. And if you eliminate that from your consideration, you are ignoring, oh gosh. Stop it. Ignore all the things. I want to ignore, but I can't. I cannot beatbox. I know that for a fact. <laughs> that, oh, man. Is that what that was? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. No, no, no. Okay, no, that was. No, no, it wasn't. Just other sound effects. Okay. Who needs blueberries? We all need blueberries. Blueberries. Blueberry pie. I don't know why. There's a whole song about blueberry <gasps> pie. There is a whole song about blue. Wow, you just transported me back to my childhood in a yes. moment. There's a story, a song about blueberries? I don't know. <laughs> that was me echolocating. Yes. Wow. This huh. Feel so berry, berry blue. That's huh. Right. Paul, I need some sleep as well. I think it's time for us to get the sleep. Justin, you stay up. Don't go to sleep. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Don't go to sleep. But the rest of I'll us need try. the rest. It's good for our eyes, good for our brains, reducing stress and aggression so that we're all nice to each other. Oh, Eric, nap. Yes. Get your sleep. Got a COVID booster. Awesome. Hopefully that'll continue to keep you protected everyone out there thank you so much for joining us i think it's it's time so what do we say right now say good night blair good night blair say good night justin i can't say i good wish morning, it could justin. i wish it say good morning justin oh good morning justin <laughs> good, good night, night kiki, kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode. And we do hope to see you next week because we will be back. And in the meantime, be sure to watch all those wonderful science holidays that are happening in the next few weeks on the Twist calendar. And uh, they're out there. All the good stuff is out there. Keep your eyes peeled. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Get your sleep. Stay curious. We'll see you next week.